Larry told me that I did not have to introduce him today. Larry, um, <laughs> but, but 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 then I thought it's the only way that I could get a good seat. So um, but he then said it has to be under thirty seconds. Um, and so I'm 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 left with this is a man who needs no introduction, okay. and um, he just stole my napkin and my my spoon. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to need it while I weep during this presentation. So Larry is going to speak on is there an emerging global crisis of democracy? Larry. Take okay. Away. Thank you, Steve. So um, <clears throat> let me say uh, that this is a new version of a recent version of a talk I've been giving for a while uh, about trends in democracy in the world. Um, and the recent version had updated with data that um, went through the end of last year, relying mainly on the annual ratings of Freedom House uh, of political rights and civil liberties in the world. Um, uh, to sustain, I, I think, you can be your own judge, uh, an argument that um, I introduced a number of years ago that I think the world was slipping into a mild recession, political recession of democracy uh, and freedom in the world, um, not an economic, uh, well, unrelated to whatever economic recession may or may not be present in the world, and of course we've had since late 2008 a very serious one. Um, I think that through some period of time, uh, it was apparent to me that we were in a situation of equilibrium, but tilting toward, as I said, this mild recession of freedom and democracy. There was a fair amount of bad news. There was also a, a, a quite a bit of encouraging news. In recent months, and um, well before Russia ripped away a part of Ukraine, which I'm not going to you know, talk about in, uh, in any specifics today, uh, but having more to do with the internal developments uh, of a number of democracies in the world, and I will say with my colleagues here, Frank and Steve and others who've been involved in our program uh, on American democracy and comparative perspective, not least the troubles of democracy in the United States. I've been worried that we may be tipping into something more serious. Well, is it a global crisis of democracy? Uh, Don Emerson wanted me to answer that at the outset so that he could leave and go hear Ezra Vogel's talk. Um, <laughs> but um, unfortunately, my answer is more complicated. So. Um, uh, uh, I can only say that, and this is the punchline to the extent there is one at all, I think we have been in an extended period of kind of equilibrium, mild recession uh, politically, and vulnerability. And I see, for reasons I will explain, a growing danger of this potentially tipping into a global crisis of democracy, and yes, potentially even into what Huntington would call a third reverse wave of um, democratic breakdowns. That is a period of time, unlike the extended, I think, still third wave that we've been in since 1974, uh, a period of time instead where the number of reversals from democracy considerably exceeds the number of transitions to democracy. So with that, uh, first let me just very, very quickly um, talk about how uh, democracy um, has expanded in the world uh, over these decades. And um, in the uh, slide behind me, you see the trends in terms of um, uh, both electoral democracies and liberal democracy. And uh, what you see is that electoral democracy, the kind of more minimal form of political democracy, and I'm going to kind of get more into that um, in a little while. Uh, electoral democracy, this doesn't seem to be working, uh, has 
expanded very dramatically and impressively during this period uh, to reach a peak in 2005. And 2005 becomes a year, an inflection point that's recurrent uh, in a lot of what I have to present to you today. And I'd say all of the reasons why the year 2005 are not entirely obvious. I have my ideas. I can't really elevate them to theories, and we can talk about it. But you can see a gradual uh, ascent of electoral democracy in the world with a key inflection point being 1989 and the end of the Cold War and the expansion of democracy, obviously, uh, not only into post-communist space, but also very dramatically into sub-Saharan Africa as well. And as I've said probably now at least three times previously in talks here, I'm um, taking as an empirical indicator of liberal democracy all those states that get a one or a two on both of the Freedom House scales of political rights and civil liberties, which extend, extend from what, one which is most free to seven which is most impressive. And the basic story is, you know, there was a gradual ascent and it kind of began to level off in the early 1990s after the end uh, of the breakdown of communist regimes. There's been a lot of uh, kind of pushing and shoving, movement into and out of the category of democracy, I'm going to get into that, and you know, there's been a gradual rise, but it's kind of descended um, since 2005, um, or at least it hasn't increased at a minimum. There's been no net uh, improvement. Okay, this is not working. Let's see if this will work. So um, these are trends in freedom uh, within different regions. And uh, since uh, the third wave of democracy began in 1974 through the end of the last calendar year, 2013. And what you see here um, is, again, you know, there's been uh, leveling off in recent years, a decline a bit in some countries. Uh, uh, more noticeable decline in sub-Saharan Africa, I'm going to get into that. Uh, and uh, the yellow line is sub-Saharan Africa, light blue is Asia Pacific. The purple, of course, is the biggest change. Those are the post-communist countries from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the brown line is the former Soviet Union minus the three Baltic states. And you can see the big jump around 1991. Uh, 89 to 91, and then the decline um, uh, among those remaining 12 states, not just Russia, but others. These are, of course, averaging both political rights and civil liberties and averaging across countries in the region. The red line is the Middle East and North Africa, and you can see it was not the most repressive region in the world in the mid-1970s. Um, Africa and the communist states were worse but it's the one that's improved the least. And of course, in recent years, uh, we can talk about what's happened in the Arab Spring, but it and the, for and the former Soviet Union are still the most repressive regions in the world. Uh, this is just a brief snapshot, snapshot of where we were in the Judgment of Freedom House uh, at the end of 2013. Now I have to say something uh, in terms of classification. I actually uh, am not in a position to make uh, confident and definitive judgments on the status of democracy in all the countries of the world. So in most instances, I have to defer to the assessment of Freedom House. I take their numbers and use them. I don't consider them perfect, although they're highly correlated with the ratings of The Economist magazine the Bertelsmann uh, Transformation Index, and even the Polity Index, though it's rather different, doesn't measure civil liberties, for example. Um, and I take their assessments of whether a country has met the criterion or criteria of at least electoral democracy, uh, in which people can choose and replace their leaders in free and fair elections. There's neutral and fair counting of the vote. Um, <coughs> multiple political parties can contest. There's reasonable access to the media for these contesting parties and so on. But occasionally their ratings are simply so 
in my opinion, jaw-droppingly implausible uh, that I've corrected them. And um, one of the propositions I want to put to you today, which is an interesting conversation I've been having for years with the authors of what I think is one of the most important books on the comparative politics of uh, regimes in the last decade or so, one of the most important, um, is uh, the book by Steve Levitsky and Luke and Wei on competitive authoritarianism. And our conversation is about where to draw the line. One reason why do they don't think there's been as much decline in democracy in the world <clears throat> in the last period of time, or maybe as many breakdowns of democracy as I count, is because they think many of these electoral democracies weren't really democracies in the first place. They were competitive authoritarian regimes. And I think that's a very serious, fair, and plausible point. But in the end, it's a judgment call about where the line is between um, electoral democracy and competitive authoritarianism. And as you'll see in this talk, um, it's one of the things that I most often struggle with. In my efforts to judge countries over the years, I have tended to find that the countries that have gradually and incrementally descended from electoral democracy to competitive authoritarianism, Freedom House has been slow, in my opinion, to recognize the dissent. I think they were slow in Russia, where I believe it happened earlier under Putin than they finally recognized and changed their score of. The same in Venezuela, the same in Nigeria, the same in Nicaragua. Uh, and today, I can't buy their classification of Tanzania and Libya as electoral democracies. Tanzania, because I think it's still a one-party dominant state. <clears throat> We've published an article in the Journal of Democracy that makes a, I think, persuasive case in that regard. Libya, because <laughs> it's not a state. And um, uh, I think we uh, have certainly uh, been reminded by Frank, uh, if we didn't know it before, that you know, if you don't have a functioning state, you don't really have very much of anything, and you certainly don't have the basis for a serious democracy. So these are the percentage of states in each reason, region that are both electoral democracies, the blue bar, and then liberal democracies, which is a subset, and in the case of the uh, Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, a complete subset of um, the electoral democracies. And then you can see the percentages over, uh, over the other regions. But what I'm interested in, in particular, uh, is the trends uh, over time. If you look at this snapshot, it really, you know, you'd hardly see a crisis of democracy, or really even a situation that we should be very alarmed by. Um, Democracy is still the overwhelmingly dominant form of government in the Americas. Um, you get, of course, uh, this big break uh, in post-communist space between uh, the states that have joined the European Union and others in, in Central and Eastern Europe, which are electoral democracies, and very few of the remaining 12 former Soviet states would be electoral democracies. Personally, I think Yanukovych was dragging Ukraine beneath the threshold of democracy um, before he was finally ousted. But that's, you know, that's the problem of the, of the gray zone regimes that we could debate. About half the states of Asia, not including the Pacific Island states, are um, uh, democracies and, and so on. Fewer in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll come back to change over time. Okay, so that's the snapshot. Now let's talk about um, what I have labeled a democratic recession, which I worried about even in the beginning of this <coughs> century was taking shape, but I think began to become more visible around or after 2005 uh, and has been you know, running through now. Uh, and these are the indicators or parameters of it. Um, First of all, as you saw from the previous slide, the percentage of states that are electoral democracies basically peaked in 2005 at about 63%. And there's been a lot of oscillation, movement in and out. I'm going to show you that, but no net improvement since then. Freedom House counts 122 democracies today, but I told you I never counted two of them. Uh, and trying to apply the 
you know, kind of cautious and conservative coding rules that I have, which is mainly to defer to them when I don't have a fairly good reason not to. Um, the percentage of democracy, the number of democracies in the world declined from about 120 to 116 and uh, returned at the end of last year to 120 because they judge that countries like Kenya, Pakistan, and Honduras became democracies in 2013. And anyone who knows anything about those three countries already has a sensitivity to a lot of the problems we're wrestling with. You can make I think an interesting and even compelling case uh, about whether any of these three countries are democracies. Um, uh, maybe this is a more hopeful judgment about the future in Nepal, but at least it's in, um, in transition in what looks like a more hopeful direction. Anyway, that's one element. Uh, the second kind of empirical uh, argument for the fact that we're in a democratic recession is that for each of the last eight years, Freedom House has judged that um, if you look at the changes in its um, more refined point scores, the ones that make up the scales of political rights and civil liberties, for each of the last eight years, the number of countries um, improving in their freedom scores has only been about half or slightly more than half of the number of countries declining in their freedom scores. And that is a dramatic reversal of what took place after the Cold War between 1991 and 2005 when uh, there was a factor of usually one and a half, two times, or in a few years, two and a half or three times as many countries improving in their freedom scores as declining. In most cases, these have been small changes, not dramatic changes, but as I'm going to show you in a minute, there have been a lot of breakdowns of democracy in this period. Uh, and that's my third point. Uh, there's been a rising pace of democratic breakdowns. These have come often in big and strategically important states. And sometimes they've happened more than once, for example, uh, in, in Thailand. Um, uh, in Nigeria, if you go back to the start of the third wave, uh, and potentially in some of these others. Several of these have returned to democracy. Certainly, I think the Philippines has. We could argue about Kenya, I've already suggested. But the key point is that the rate of breakdowns has been increasing. So if you're just taking the question, in year X, uh, did uh, an electoral democracy exist, and in year X plus one, was it still there? And if it isn't for any reason, and the reason doesn't have to be a military coup, an executive coup, it could just be Chavez finally dragging down the political system in Venezuela beneath the threshold where we can no longer call that electoral democracy anymore. <clears throat> and um, uh, if you use all of that as possible uh, uh, empirical coding ground rules, for a democratic breakdown, the rate in kind of the first 13 years of this 40-year uh, period was the uh, rate of democratic failure was about 16 and a half percent between 1987 and 1999, which in a way I think was the heyday of the third wave, the kind of peak of expansion and momentum. The rate of democratic decline had fallen to 12 and a half percent of democratic breakdown. Excuse me. And then in this most recent roughly 13, actually in this case the last 14 years, the rate had increased to 19.3%. And you know, pretty sobering figure here, and keep in mind this has been happening during a period of overall democratic expansion and momentum in the world. Uh, and that is that, you know, if you're counting democracies in a fairly, uh, generous way, which is what Freedom House has been doing, um, and not with the somewhat more demanding coding structure of Levitsky and Way, uh, and then when they fall below a certain threshold or fail for whatever reason, that's a breakdown of democracy, then almost a third of all the electoral democracies that have existed in this period have failed. Um, I am listing here examples. The examples 
uh, in the right-hand column are mainly of recent cases, so you'll see the examples. It's not of all the earlier ones, but obviously during the third wave, the Indian emergency was one of the first. So of these breakdowns, um, the majority have seen a return to democracy. Uh, and in uh, some cases, like Thailand, there's been a breakdown more than once. And uh, that was, uh, by the way, the year of breakdown and the year of return. And then another 23, ha in many cases, because they've happened so recently, have seen no breakdown, uh, no return to democracy. So overall, we have nearly uh, one third of all the democracies in the world having failed uh, and not returned or having failed and after some period of time, short or long, returned. Uh, the, it's not surprising that democratic erosion would be most visible in Africa if you take the political sociology theory about the conditions for democracy that they're strongly related to economic development, a well-developed state, a large middle class, an educated population. Africa's uh, the region of the world where these conditions are probably least present. And so you would expect um, that maybe democracy would not have emerged very much, or if it did, it would be experiencing a lot of problems. Actually, given that, what's interesting is that still, depending on how you count, you could probably move some of these in a different category of competitive authoritarianism, and I've already suggested to you that Kenya might be one of the first that I would move, but still, there's clearly a critical mass of electoral democracies in sub-Saharan Africa. Not a trivial one, and not something that modernization theory uh, would predict. On the other hand, if you're looking over time uh, in these different increments, and looking across the four categories of liberal democracy, again, just taking all the countries that get a one or a two on each of the uh, seven-point Freedom House scales, electoral democracies, the countries that have reasonably free and fair elections but are not liberal, competitive authoritarian regimes where they don't meet the conditions of democracy but there are multiple political parties, there's some uncertainty in elections, uh, opposition parties get a significant share of seats in the assembly or the parliament or whatever, um, and of if there's a presidential election, perhaps at least a plausible share of the presidential vote, and then authoritarian regimes that are not politically competitive in this way, and are usually, though not always, uh, more repressive. And you can see that, you know, this category has been gaining momentum. Now, I'll just get ahead of myself here and say one of the things that's going on, and I think it's uh, one of the things we should worry about. During this period here, uh, so I'd say from 1991 through the 1990s, democracy really was, in a sense, uh, uh, in a geopolitical sense of power and in a sense of the narrative about regimes in Africa, the only game in town. Uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed. China was not so much present in the minds, certainly, of the authoritarian or would-be authoritarian rulers in Africa, and even so much of their peoples. It wasn't as economically present. And um, the democracy donors, the democracies that gave aid, uh, Canada, the U.S., uh, European Union, the individual European donors, we're starting in a variety of ways to condition their aid on democracy, better governance, so on and so forth. And so during this period here, uh, there was more pressure uh, to either move in a democratic direction or at least have some semblance <laughs> of uh, democracy and not look, you know, nakedly authoritarian. And in a way, I'd say democracy reached its high point in the early 2000s in sub-Saharan Africa. But for the last eight years, there's been a downward trend. It's, again, it's not dramatic. That's actually one of the interesting things. But when you look at the realities on the ground in sub-Saharan Africa, I think there is an element of um, worrisome vulnerability. It's been there for a while. 
But given the geopolitical balance in the world, China's rising leverage with development assistance, Europe's and America's lack of uh, inspiration as a model for democracy, and the declining willingness of Europe and the United States to continue to exert leverage for democracy, and the increasingly conflicting imperatives of the global war on terror, the struggle for resources, the struggle for markets, the struggle for oil, and so on, uh, it's not really all that favorable a time. And in this sense, in terms of countries that no longer feel the need to even gesture uh, at multi-party democracy, we're kind of, we're moving back a bit. Um, I had a hunch about why this was a case, just from my own experience on the ground in Africa, uh, and I thought it would be useful to take the Freedom House scales of political rights and civil liberties and decompose them. Uh, one of the, I'd say, very legitimate criticisms of Freedom House is that they combine too much into these scales. But for the last eight years, since 2005, they've made their raw point scores available on their uh, component scales of political rights and civil liberties. So you can take um, the control of corruption uh, and the quality of governance in a way out of one scale. You can take the independence of the judiciary out of the other scale and assemble them into a third scale of transparency and rule of law. Uh, and that is the scale um, on this lower bar here, the yellow bar. So what I've done is take um, these scores, uh, which are no longer seven point scores because they're raw point scores that are assembled in the seven point scores, and for simplicity I've just standardized them on a zero to 100 scale. Uh, and you can see here two things. Number one, all three scales of what's left of civil liberties, what's left of political and electoral rights, and the new scale of transparency and rule of law have been in decline uh, in sub-Saharan Africa since 2005. Um, but uh, by far the lowest scale, the worst dimension of performance, has been transparency and rule of law. Uh, and I think if you could figure out how to lift this up toward at least a kind of middling level of performance, uh, no single thing that could be done would probably be a better investment in sustaining democracy uh, in general, I'd say, in the world, but certainly in sub-Saharan Africa and in other kind of vulnerable places uh, than that. So this is something to bear in mind more generally and not just about sub-Saharan Africa. All right, a fifth thing that I find worrisome, have found worrisome for a while, has been the much more incremental and in some ways I suppose you could say disputable uh, erosion of democracy in Latin America. I think uh, that the Chavez phenomenon of a kind of new left, anti-American, and illiberal populism has been a harbinger of something uh, broader in Latin America. And in some ways, it's a movement of lower class peoples who've been excluded from the distribution of benefits, were not terribly well empowered by the pre-existing institutions, and were certainly heavily marginalized by the two-party dominant system very elite dominated, very corrupt in Venezuela that had prevailed for a long time and had not adapted to incorporate them. But we see echoes of this as well in Bolivia and Ecuador, very subtle ones. I actually, I don't know enough about Bolivia and Ecuador to, um, uh, to, to feel confident in coding them as electoral democracies any longer. <laughs> but since I also don't know enough to feel confident uh, to code them otherwise, I've left them in the electoral democracy category. But there have been trends in terms of intimidation of the media, intimidation of opponents, a narrative that delegitimates opposition. That is the really crucial characteristic, which we find in Turkey, we find in a lot of places, that um, I think is worrisome and can pave the way, grease the skids for uh, an absolute descent into uh, 
some form of authoritarianism. That's already happened in Nicaragua, where uh, Daniel Ortega has um, dragged the system down uh, beneath the level of electoral democracy. And in this period, seven countries uh, since 2005 in Latin America have declined in their Freedom House score. Four have improved. Um, it's not a disastrous situation. But there's another element here that worries me. It worries me more broadly, but I'll um, introduce it now. And that is, uh, if you read the Inter-American Charter uh, on Democracy, I think a very historic document, which in some ways had the uh, misfortune of being adopted in Lima, Peru on September 11, 2001. So it's not like that was dominating the news in terms of what was happening globally that day. Um, but it, uh, it created for the first time a, a kind of regional political imperative and potential set of mechanisms to respond to the loss or crisis or deterioration of democracy. Um, and the instrument for doing that, the Organization of American States, has, in my opinion, not taken this seriously. They took it seriously um, when a left-wing president, Zelaya, was you know, taken out of his uh, house in the middle of a night and uh, ushered out of the country in a coup-like, um, uh, well, I'd say in a coup, uh, uh, against um, an elected government, although one, again, we get into the ambiguities that seem to be moving in this authoritarian left populist direction. So the OAS responded to that, but um, in all four of these instances, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, which I think are the two clearest ones, Bolivia, Ecuador, more subtle ones, there's been no, a, no OAS response. And the OAS Secretary General, in my opinion, and that of many others in the region, um, I think has been, to a considerable extent, uh, excessively passive, put it politely, or asleep at the wheel. Uh, and we now have Venezuela slipping into possible large-scale violence, uh, even uh, something more approaching, uh, you know, organized civil strife. Um, the regime is increasingly desperate. Uh, I think there are a lot of indications that the last presidential election that gave the uh, president who succeeded Hugo Chavez, uh, Nicolas Maduro, his own mandate, by a very narrow margin that uh, the margin may have been delivered by electoral fraud. There certainly wasn't a level playing field. And that alone suggests that the opposition candidate um, would have won a free and fair election. But besieged as he is, inept as he is, incompetent as he is, crude as he is, Maduro has now been taking a much more violent and repressive approach to dealing with the opposition. Uh, several young people have been killed. Uh, crime is spinning out of control. I mean, Venezuela may eventually get rid of this deepening authoritarianism, but only in a circumstance of you know, partial state disintegration, which we know from much experience and some impressive recent analysis uh, is not a favorable uh, condition um, for uh, democracy. Now we come to um, what I think is better termed the Arab freeze than the Arab spring. And I take a long-term view of the struggle for uh, democracy, accountability, human rights uh, in the Arab world. I, I think this is something that's going to be, uh, that's not going to go away. The underlying problems of legitimacy have not even begun to be responded to by most of these regimes. So we're talking about a process of, of change that's probably going to unfold over a couple of decades or more. But the point is, the first three years have not been real uplifting. Uh, we have an authoritarian implosion in Egypt that has uh, been um, uh, in the process of creating a state more repressive uh, and more vindictive against opposition than anything that Egypt has seen in decades. With tones of demonization of opposition, uh, demonization of intellectual critics as traitors and fifth columnists, um, 
glorification of the nation, glorification of a heroic leader, that have, I'm now uh, in a way quoting the language of our colleague Amr Hamzawi, the Egyptian political scientist who was supposed to have arrived here uh, on Monday to be a visiting scholar at CDDRL, but could not come because he is being prosecuted by the Egyptian authorities for having issued a tweet, what, a couple few months ago, uh, declaring the um, uh, trials of the civil society activists um, uh, who were arrested uh, uh, and the international uh, democracy promotion organizations who were working on the ground and supporting them, declaring these trials as akin to a kangaroo court or something like that, which obviously they are. The whole thing is, um, is an authoritarian charade. But anyway, uh, Egypt has turned in a very hard and very ugly authoritarian direction. I think most of you know um, the brutality of the crackdown in Bahrain that's uh, crushed uh, what was a peaceful movement for democratic change that I think could have been willing to live with the Sunni minority monarchy and work out some kind of deal. We could debate how plausible that was, but in any case, with U.S. acquiescence and um, uh, condoning of it and the intervention of Gulf Cooperation Council troops, a very brutal political order has been imposed there. We've talked about Libya which is now uh, conjuries of uh, militias. It's, you know, you can't even call it a state. Uh, the civil war in Syria, it's destabilizing spillovers into Jordan and Lebanon. Um, but we've got, you know, one and a half uh, reasons for uh, some hope. And I'm going to close by suggesting it's a difficult time period. We have to really bet on hope. Um, where we see it emerging. One, of course, is the emergence of the first Arab democracy uh, in at least 40 years in Tunisia. And the second is a national dialogue uh, conference process facilitated by a UN mediator who both Steve and I have worked with, Jamal Benamar, that has created a framework. It may or may not hold Yemen together, but has at least created a framework in which constitutional negotiations can proceed. I won't dwell on this, but if you compare the Freedom House scores in 2010 and 2013 of the 16 Arab states of the Middle East and North Africa, it, you know, it's not a net picture of uh, democratic uh, progress. Uh, it's been more regression than progress with one clear success story in Tunisia. So now let me um, give the final phase of this talk, which is where we're at now and whether this um, constitutes uh, a crisis of democracy. If you think there is a looming or potential crisis, one of the things you'd have to be worried about is even before Russia invaded uh, Crimea and Putin moved, what, 40,000 troops? I don't know how many, uh, to the border of eastern Ukraine and began to beat his chest with excitement uh, over um, his conquests and the revival of uh, a Russia that could stand up to the West and all the other stuff that Catherine has been writing about. Even before that, you know, you'd have to be worried about the deepening authoritarianism in Russia, its effort to reconstruct an alliance structure um, that uh, wasn't going to be called the Soviet Union, but what's the Eurasian Union. The Eurasian Union. Uh, and of course, um, the even bigger elephant in the room is China, its continued economic dynamism, political self confidence, uh, and resistance so far to democratic change. These authoritarian regimes are increasingly coordinating with one another and adapting, uh, sharing technology to suppress the internet. Uh, and other tools of um, surveillance and uh, repression. Uh, this is uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which we know about is one vehicle for this. But I think uh, across you know, Eurasian and Middle Eastern space, there's a certain amount of sharing going on. And there's, there is a sense out there in a lot of places in the world that the dynamism and kind of momentum and power in a way is now shifting 
away from the democracies to the authoritarian states. This is one reason why it's not the, even the most important one maybe, I think we should just worry about Ukraine and the future of NATO, but it, it is an important reason why I think if we fail to stand up to vigorously, and we cannot only mean the United States, it must mean the European Union and the individual democracies with the, in the European Union. If we fail to stand up uh, to this kind of aggression and intimidation and what could 40 or 50,000 troops on the border of a vulnerable aspiring democracy that doesn't want to reunify with Russia mean but intimidation, then um, you know, the shift is going to become more pronounced. Then we get to the problem that is the subject of our program on American democracy and comparative perspective that I don't have to time to discuss now. But um, there is a sense out there, and as I travel, I'm guessing, Frank, you find it as well, and my colleagues in their travels, you know, a lot of people are increasingly looking at the United States uh, and some of our European um, uh, um, allies and saying, why should we want that? This kind of paralysis and incapacity to deal with obviously serious governance challenges like, hey, for example, adopting a budget. Um, and we are, we are suffering. Our image and soft power in the world is seriously, seriously eroding because of the poor performance politically and institutionally of democracy in the United States. And this is why I've said, and will say again here, there's nothing, there's no single thing that the United States could do that would more assist the prospects for democracy in the world than repair its own democracy. I don't think it's the only thing we should do, uh, but it's a critical thing. And now we come to the swing states. Big states outside the industrialized, stable, liberal, democratic West um, that uh, I'm going to show you in a little while, 26 of them. Maybe it's an overly generous list. But there are countries that have, um, by the calculation I'm using here, more than 50 million people or a, a gross domestic product over $300 um, uh, billion, dollars, one or the other. Uh, and if you just look at three of these and a few others that, you know, uh, I, I think have been going through a rough patch, there's a lot to worry about. Um, now, uh, I hopefully will be corrected by uh, one or more of my colleagues if um, they feel I've got any of this wrong. But I think most of you know uh, or have some sense of the deep, serious troubles that Thailand has been in since uh, the military overthrew Prime Minister Thaksin and forced him into exile in 2006. Uh, basically, what's so interesting about this is it's a kind of classic 19th, early 20th century conflict between you know, a dominant kind of class coalition and a rising class coalition that's been historically excluded. And even though this gentleman Toxin, their hero, is worth something like $2 billion. They nevertheless adopted as their defender and hero. And now that he's out of the way after a coup and more um, uh, political intervention and intimidation by the ruling elite, uh, his sister, who's I'm sure on the phone with him uh, to Dubai every day taking instructions, uh, Yinluk uh, Shinawat, is prime minister and um, and running the show in Thailand. The recent crisis that's been going on for a few months, by the way, was triggered by um, Prime Minister Yen Luk introducing a motion in Parliament that might have led to the pardoning of Thaksin and his return. And that, of course, was um, uh, just a bridge too far, uh, completely unacceptable to the pro-monarchy, pro-establishment, elite, yellow shirt opposition. Uh, and there's you know, without some sort of pact or refashioning of what Dahl called a system of mutual security, agreement, you know, on, on new rules of the game or refashioning of the old rules of the game, there's no way to resolve this crisis because the electoral majority clearly lies right now with um, Prime Minister Thaksin and his party, now the Futai Party. 
uh, before, who knows, it might be banned and renamed again. Um, and yet, much of the institutional power, military power, and so on, still lies with um, the uh, previous dominant political and social forces in the country. And so you have a former Deputy Prime Minister, Sutep, who leads something called the People's Democratic Reform Committee, which is something like a contradiction in terms because they're so determined to do everything else over what presumably would be an extended period of reform before you get to, I'd say, a pretty important element in democracy, which is elections, which they want to delay as long as possible because they know they're going to lose them. Um, and yet, uh, I've already implied that you've had very serious abuses of power and the rule of law under Prime Minister Thaksin, his sister, and his governments. Uh, the constitutional crisis now, and it's serious, if there was, if I woke up tomorrow, turned on CNN, and read that there's been a military coup in Thailand, uh, you know, I would not be in the least surprised. Um, there's now the National Anti-Corruption Commission has, is considering a case against the Prime Minister. If they recommend impeachment and the Senate approves it, she'll be removed. If the Constitutional Court, in a separate case that's pending, uh, determines that she's violated her public trust, they can remove her directly. And if that happens, um, uh, there could be blood in the streets. As a Thai analyst, uh, Verapot recently wrote, no longer makes sense to attempt to explain the current political situation by relying on legal principles. It's more or less a phenomenon of raw politics where the rule of law is conveniently stretched and stripped to fit a political goal. And thus you've got red shirts, the defenders of Toxin and Yin Luk and this populist uh, political insurgency against the long-established status quo saying back in January, I want there to be lots of violence to put an end to all this, meaning the pro-monarchy, pro-establishment uh, uh, demonstrations in the streets that have been undermining the economy and governability of Ying Luk's government. I'm bored by its speeches. It's time to clean the country, to get rid of the elite, all of them. You know, this was this is a little bit like the language that was being used in Rwanda before the genocide. Here we have the new leader of the Thai red shirts, Jatuporn, uh, and they are named, <laughs> you know, uh, you could only find this in a novel, the National United Front of Democracy Against Dictatorship. The rally, and that's the rally that is coming this weekend in two days, is to prepare a systematic war against the opposing camp. The principle of the rally is to stop efforts, that is their efforts, of the pro-monarchy establishment to foil democracy. And uh, these people are arming, they are serious, uh, and there is the prospect of uh, very tragic levels of violence in an otherwise peaceful country. The new commander of the first division of the King's Guard has said, lace majesty, and this is certainly <laughs> construed as that will not be tolerated, and uh, it's a really scary situation. Steve and I are just back from Turkey. Uh, I think this country um, may no longer be able to be called a democracy. It's not because um, the uh, Justice and Development Party, the AKP, uh, is not supported by a plurality of voters in Turkey. I think it pretty clearly is, but um, the fear that has descended on this country. The eclipse of freedom of the press, the um, intimidation of opponents, the scope of the Aragonicon scandal, which I think, the, which is the uh, alleged coup plot against the government, which most, I think, independent observers believe was at a minimum conveniently and ruthlessly widened to take in as wide an arc of journalistic and elite opponents of the uh, AKP as possible, has reached a point where I, I really think it's difficult to argue that there is a sufficiently level playing field and a sufficiently open climate for criticism and reporting so that we can say electoral democracy exists. Here are the Prime Minister's remarks a few nights ago after uh, he won a pretty strong electoral victory 
in the local elections uh, on Sunday. We are the owners of this country. The people will not bow, and Turkey is invincible. Those who had been part of his ruling coalition in the deep state but are supporters of this um, cult, Islamic cult leader in Pennsylvania, Gulan, those who managed, who managed could flee. More can flee tomorrow, but from now on, will walk into their dens, they will pay for this. How can you threaten our national security? And, you know, uh, they've been hit with a full Ottoman slap by the nation. And I think a lot of the liberal opposition feels that way right now in uh, Turkey as well. I mean, you can interpret these election results however you want. It certainly can't be seen to the extent the results are legitimate um, as a, anything but an improvement over previous local election results for the AKP. The main opposition party, you can see, is gradually improving. The Republican People's Party may be revived by leadership change soon, but it's got a very uphill struggle. I think you know what's been happening in Bangladesh, where um, uh, the opposition BNP boycotted the last election because the sitting prime minister, Sheikh Hasina, uh, changed the rules of the game to eliminate the provision for a, um, uh, a caretaker prime minister to oversee elections. So her Awami League won all the seats. There have just been election results for local elections. Those are now mired in controversy. Uh, I mean, the one hopeful thing I can say is um, that in a lot of these places, it's a contested situation. But, you know, the game is hardly over. Um, South Africa's been on a descent of mild decline. Uh, it's, I, I think it's had a succession of increasingly uh, unimpressive presidents since um, uh, Nelson Mandela, and this guy's in a category by himself. Within the South African context, he's just been found to be, you know, $30 million to improve his, his home. Um, with state funds, uh, and uh, there's a belief that the corruption has been much greater than that, and there's a very strong societal reaction against it. But elections are coming. The ANC in May, the ANC may suffer very serious setbacks. I'm going to post these slides. You can look at these 26 um, strategic swing states and kind of ponder for yourself the trends in terms of democracy. But, you know, as I've suggested, there's not a lot of soaring success stories. I mean, South Korea is a stable democracy. India, uh, democracy's been in, uh, performing increasingly poorly. Maybe it will be revived in the elections that are coming in a few weeks, maybe not. Um, uh, there's a potential for a deeper crisis there if the BJP's <coughs> leader, Modi, Narendra Modi, who many people think has blood on his hands from the anti-Muslim pogroms in his state some years ago becomes, as I think he's very likely to become, prime minister. Uh, these are the others. I haven't even talked about the crisis in Taiwan now, where uh, youthful enthusiasts of the opposition party have taken control of the parliament building and are occupying it. Um, I try to speak to that if you want, but if you really want to begin to understand it, read Karis Templeman's blog. Um, so let me just conclude with this. Uh, I think that um, we also have a problem of a lot of countries uh, that are in a gray zone now, both in terms of whether, where their democracies now and where they're headed. And um, it's a situation that's in a way an extension and intensification of the democratic recession, but is... Um, is more posed, poised for a, um, a, a tipping into something really nasty than at any point I think we've been at since the third wave began. It doesn't mean it will happen, but you know, if you've got violence and democratic breakdown and God knows what possible protracted civil conflict in Thailand, uh, the bottom falling out uh, in Turkey. These are big, important states uh, that people look to and that can exert diffusion effects in their region and beyond. Um, I've got some thoughts about uh, why democracy is in danger and uh, what we should do about it. And um, 
I uh, just let you stare at this while I uh, answer your questions.